Welcome to another episode of Facts and Fuckery. What's going on, y'all? Hi. How are you? I hope you're doing great. I hope you're doing great. How's your weekend that we're about to go into? How was your last weekend? Was it good? How's your week been? Fantastic. Welcome to Friday. You fucking made it. So excited. We have, it's going to be a great weekend. First of all, we've got some, uh, whoops, <laughs> hit the wrong button. Uh, we got some great things in store for the UFO No Show. So go and check that out. Sunday, 6.30 p.m. live on Rumble. Um, this show, I got a good one. I got some stuff that I think you're going to find interesting because uh, I found it interesting. So, uh, you know, hence uh, we're going over it. So let's get right into it, shall we? Sharing is caring, so uh, spread it's like gossip. Let's get right into it. Meh. Meh. All right, here we go. <laughs> figure out what the fuck i'm trying to do here so right off the bat we got a story about uh ai apps that offer the illusion of talking to the dead and it's really interesting it's it's kind of funny how whenever there's a new technology that comes out that pops up there's this natural instinct to try and connect with the beyond whatever it is you know, uh, that's, uh, there's a guy, Mark Sample, uh, he's a digital studies professor and that's, he points out the historical trend of any time there's something new that comes out, people automatically try and use it to figure out what's on the other side, which is natural. That's one of, uh, humanity's greatest questions. What is after death? I think most of us want to know that, right? Great example is, uh, Thomas Edison, when he invented the spirit phone, his whole idea was he wanted to contact the dead with the spirit phone. And, uh, you know, now we're in this era of artificial intelligence and guess what? <laughs> People are, are wanting to use it to contact the dead. The interesting thing is they're actually crafting chat bots of their dearly departed. So, uh, in other words, uh, well, for example, there's this lady, Stephanie Lucas Oni. I think it's Oni or Oney or Oni. I don't know. Anyways, she is using an app called. She scared the shit out of me. I had a cat over there. God damn it. Uh, she's using a an app called Hereafter AI to have a heart to heart conversation with her dead father, former black police officer and judge from Harlem. But here's what's interesting. He, the, the responses that you get from the AI, cause my whole thing is, well, how are they able to get the likeness of this person, um, in the app, right? Like how, how would they get my grandmother? How would they get my grandfather? You know, I, what's the deal? Well, the catch is that these people have to agree to the idea and be willing to do this before they pass away. So as in, you have to already know that this thing exists in order to get in on it. His responses for this lady, Stephanie Lucas, Oni or Oni or whatever, uh, was based on interviews that were done with her father to get these uh, responses. And some of these people, of course, some people are fascinated by the idea. I apologize. I'm drinking a 7-Up and it's giving me the boips. So let me take another sip. Ah Cheers, everybody. Happy Friday. So, um, yeah, so, so there's a lot of people that are fascinated with the idea, which who wouldn't be? I mean, if it, it kind of gives you that ability to pick someone's brain that maybe like maybe your future grandchildren or your future children or whatever, you know, will have a chance to do that. But it's also very creepy. It's creepy because it's this idea that, well, there's a crucial aspect to people being able to grapple with grief, right? And, and be able to have a, a healthy approach to grief. And I feel like this is something that's really going to hinder that, hinder people's ability to deal with grief, 
and move on because they're going to have this opportunity to, in essence, have this, the idea of this person around forever. And it's going to almost be like a chasing the dragon type of thing because at first it's going to fit, it's going to seem like it fits in that void and fills that void. But as you go on, it's not going to be the same. So that void is, is going to feel bigger and there, therefore it's going to be less filled and you're going to be less satisfied and, and still have to deal with the grief. So it's only prolonging the inevitable. But anyways, it makes me, it's very, very interesting, right? That we're headed into this. AI is going to help people talk to their dead relatives. Weird, man. I don't, I, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of that. I would not want to do that with my loved ones. Uh, I don't know about you. I'm curious. So let me know if that's something you would do. I'm curious because I would not. I would not. But on to our next story. That was just a little short one. I thought that was interesting, but. For our next story, we have AI recreating images from human brain waves with terrifying accuracy is what it says. So here's the deal. Here's what it says. Advancements in brain wave conversion, a breakthrough research at the National Institute for Quantum Science and Technology. So a team of researchers achieved a significant milestone by converting brain waves into highly accurate AI-generated images. Published in the recent edition of Neural Networks, the study showcased the capability of AI in producing images solely from human thought. Notably, the accuracy of these thought-generated images reached an impressive 75%, surpassing the 50% accuracy observed in previous experiments. The research represents a substantial improvement in accuracy compared to prior attempts at mapping brainwaves with AI. Studies findings open new possibilities for understanding and harnessing the potential for the human brain through AI technology. Subjects were exposed to 1,200 images and later asked to recall them during brainwave scans using an fMRI machine. The resulting brainwave data from the recall process was fed into a generative AI program. The program successfully reconstructed images based solely on the subject's memory, receiving or achieving a 75.6% accuracy rate after a 500-step revision process. As the brainwave reconstruction technologies refine the potential applications in medical fields become apparent, AI-generated images from brainwaves could become instrumental in treating patients who face communication challenges, especially those unable to communicate verbally, or, or allow people to be able to capture their dreams. How rad would that be? How rad would that be to be able to capture your dreams, record your dreams, and then go back and watch them and kind of break them down and see what it means? Maybe it applies to something. I would love that. I would love that. Those of you who have nightmares, though, I wonder if you would be as keen on the idea of saving your dreams. You know, some people, they all they have is bad dreams. You know what I mean? Like there's people that all they have is nightmares and and bad dreams and it's all it's all negative shit. And then there's other people where they have those dreams where they're flying. You know, where they're they're saving a, a, a you know, they're on a plane full of terrorists and they save the day. They beat up the bad guy, whatever it is, you know, or maybe you fight ninjas. I don't know what your dreams are. I don't know. Maybe maybe you're just rescuing a lady in a bikini from a really nice beach. And, uh, you know, fire happens to burn off the bikini. I don't know. I don't know. It's your dream. It's your dream, you freak. So advancements in brainwave mapping with AI offer scientists a deep understanding of how the brain or how the human brain sells visual stimuli for memory. Once perfected, this technology could be applied in veterinary clinics to provide accurate visual representations of animals' thoughts. Very interesting. Consideration of brainwaves in blind subjects opens up possibilities for understanding non-visual interpretation of the world and could have applications in assisting blind individuals. The technology's potential extends beyond humans, raising questions about the possibility of utilizing non-human brainwaves. Speculations include applications in veterinary care and understanding how individuals born blind interpret the world through non-visual stimuli. We already talked about that. Why did I do it twice? (laughs) I don't know. 
Uh, the technology, while promising, is not without ethical considerations and requires further refinement before practical applications are widely adopted. As accuracy improves and technology progresses, there is a need to explore potential ethical implications, privacy concerns, and societal impacts. Well, yeah, I mean, the, obviously, there is always ethical concerns. The problem is is that nine times out of 10, the government, DARPA, whoever you want to say, whatever name you want to put behind it, is usually working on a diabolical, sinister version of something like this. Right now, I'm thinking capturing thoughts, predictive programming type stuff, you know, minority report-esque situation where it's like pre-crime you know things like that they try and predict crime which they're already trying to do based on trends so i think yeah it could but to be honest with you like images produced from brainwaves to me doesn't sound bad it doesn't sound like well how do you turn that into a weapon how do you weaponize that and turn that against the individual? Yeah, you're able to basically print out their thoughts, you know, have a have a imagery-based collection. I don't know, maybe eventually it'll just type it all out. But I think for now, man, the possibilities to me is like I would love to be able to think of, I mean, because I can think of better imagery that I can actually paint or draw or anything like that. So that would be rad. That would be rad. Like instead of text inputs for AI generated images. It's actually thought input, you know, to where all you do is think about the image you want to produce and it produces that image. That would be rad. That would be rad. That'd be pretty sweet. So right now, I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine something bad coming out of it, but dude, I'm telling you, that's the one thing the government's really good at is turning something good into something bad. You know what I mean? Weaponizing technology and things like that. You know, we have a lot of that going on. So they're really good at that. So I, even though I can't think of anything right now, I'm curious if any of you can think of anything, but I'm not sure. So let me know if you have any ideas of how we can turn this AI brainwave imagery thing into a into a super psychic weapon i don't know let, let me know but uh this is a little bit uh alarming i should say the least is microsoft is heavily investing in nuclear power to meet the energy demands of its ai models this move is driven by the significant power consumption of machine learning leading tech companies to seek eco-friendly alternatives to traditional energy sources. Microsoft is taking an innovative approach to training an AI to handle the paperwork involved in setting up new nuclear power plants, aiming to streamline the lengthy and costly approval process. So machine learning, a core component of AI, requires substantial electricity, and tech companies like Microsoft are exploring cleaner alternatives to fossil fuels to power their energy-intensive AI models. Microsoft is betting on nuclear power. The company is specifically interested in small modular reactors, or SMRs, which are scaled-down nuclear power plants designed to reduce construction costs through component standardization. Why don't we all have that? Why does fucking Bill Gates get it? Why does he get it for his AI shit? Why don't we get it? Why don't why don't why doesn't humanity get that? You're telling me that he can take an alternative to solar and wind energy and put it into a small modular reactor, a scaled down nuclear power plant, but yet we can't do that for the jet. What, what the fuck? If this is not a blatant, a blatant sign that douchebags like Bill Gates have access to the world's best technology 
And we don't, I mean, as if we didn't already know, but I'm just saying, like, it's kind of one of those things that you say because you know, but there's like no proof around. There's no like hard evidence that you can grab and be like, here's what he's doing with it. But look, here we have it coming right out and saying it. This should be something that general humanity has access to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And fucking Bill Gates gets it to run his AI better, to make his AI run more effectively. But otherwise, we don't get it. Oh, these douchebags. I hate them. I hate them all. So, so far, aside from Microsoft taking, you know, nuclear power to run his AI, all the things that we've seen so far are good aspects of AI being used, right? But here's something that I think a lot of people are worried about, talking about like pre-crime and things like that. Check this out. This guy, Russian hydrologist Alexander Svetkov, was detained in February 2023. Why? Because an AI, an AI system claiming a 55% match, only that's a little bit, a little bit above half. So almost a 50 50 chance it was this person. And it was a sketch done by the AI system that was a 55% match, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The AI system matched 55% to this hydrologist to a sketch of a murderer that was drawn 20 years ago. Here's what's crazy. He was a scientist at the Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of Inland Water Biology, and he was facing these accusations dating back to August 2nd of 2002. Those murders involved the killing of a man after a quarrel. A quarrel! Tell you what. When somebody says quarrel, first I think squirrel because I'm dumb, but also it's like the, I think of two guys that are like, no, you're a prick. And the other one's like, oh, yes? Oh, no, you're the prick. I'm not the prick. You're the prick. That's a quarrel. You know, like two, two real prissy dudes yelling at each other in a very weak way. Like, like you know, yeah. But apparently it was a little more than that because it turned into murder. But anyways, either way, it ends in two the robbing of a 64-year-old woman, attacking and killing another woman and her 90-year-old mother under the pretext of wanting to rent an apartment. Svetkov's alleged accomplice identified him, but discrepancies arose in the testimony. The accomplice describes Svetkov as homeless, a drinker, and a smoker. Traits inconsistent with the hydrologist's actual lifestyle. Claims of tattoos on Svetkov's fingers contradicted statements from his family that he never had any tattoos. Colleagues and scientists provided alibis, placing Svetkov far from the crime. But authorities disregarded all of these and insisted on the 55% match as the key evidence. So guess what? They went and they got him, and he spent 10 months, 10 months in jail with his family trying to get him out. And again, it was only a 55% match, which is nuts. That is nuts. So the idea is that it raises some serious concerns about the, not only, here's what I would say. The article goes into how there's this, concern about the reliability and accountability of the AI. But let's just be certain here, okay, that it wasn't the AI that went out and arrested this guy. It was real police officers that decided to take the 55% unreliable and unaccountable, basically, AI system at its word. 
So it's not the AI's fault for giving a shitty answer. It's the it's the the police's fault for going with it, for going along with it. So what the fuck? Everybody wants to blame AI for this. It's these dipshits that believe the 55%. So, of course, gets a lot of attention for it. They ran a public campaign to help get him out. That even <laughs> Vladimir Putin contributed to. Dude, dude, hey, when he's right, he's right. When he's wrong, I guess he's wrong. But when he's right, he's right. And he's right about that. So he was released, but the charges still haven't been dropped. Amazing. So it, it's just kind of funny to think about how that works. You know what I mean? Uh, so the article basically is saying that uh, that this whole ordeal brings to attention the delicate balance between technology and human judgment in legal matters and emphasizes the importance of safeguarding against wrongful accusations based on AI findings and dipshit cops who want to take the lazy route and take the AI's word for it when it simply gives them the answer they want. You know, like they're 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 stacking the case based on evidence that they're putting together to support their theories as opposed to stacking the evidence in the direction of what points to the truth. So to me, it highlights a lack of credibility and accountability within policing obviously this uh took place in russia and so you know you can argue all that you know the ethical stuff going on in russia but either way to me this is just harping on ai when all ai did was said well it might be a 55 percent match to this it didn't say go arrest him it didn't say he did it it didn't say all that was all human decision you can blame the AI all you want, but the AI didn't arrest the guy. The AI didn't falsely accuse the guy. It just gave a, a mat, how much of a match it was, and then they ran with it. So that's a human problem, and that's the issue with AI is generally it's humans that are fucking it up. So, yeah. Anyways. Um, all right, I got another good one. This is uh, very interesting. Cracked piece of metal heals itself in experiment that stuns scientists at Sandia National Laboratories in Texas A&M University made a groundbreaking discovery of a metal healing itself, a phenomenon never witnessed before in material science. The research involved a team using a specialized transmission electron microscope technique to subject a 40 nanometer thick piece of platinum to repeated stress, pulling it ends 20 or 200 times per second to test its resilience. The metal exhibited self-healing at ultra small scales, revealing an unexpected ability to repair fatigue damage caused by microscopic breaks due to repeated stress and motion. After approximately 40 minutes of observation, researchers noted the crack in the platinum spontaneously fusing back together and mending itself, a process occurring at the nanoscale. Materials scientist Brad Boyce expressed astonishment at the unexpected discovery, emphasizing that metals possess an intrinsic natural ability to self-heal, at least under certain nanoscale conditions. This self-healing metal phenomenon, if fully understood and controlled, could mark the beginning of a transformative era in engineering. The potential applications extend to repairing various structures from bridges to engines to electronic devices. It's metal. I mean, yeah, it's anything metal. <laughs> it's, yeah, we got it. We got it. You guys can read the whole article for yourself. But it's fascinating to think that... There's actually a self-healing, a self-healing process that can be applied to metal. That's rad. I mean, imagine, but it also makes me think about the 
claims by Marcel in the original Roswell incident uh, that uh, involved metals he hadn't seen. I mean, look at where we're at. Even though it's been a long time, I mean, is this something that could have been behind closed doors a lot longer than what we're being told? And therefore, when he saw it, it was so outside of its time that a lot of people thought it couldn't possibly be human. But here we are. Or, or are you on the fence or on the side of the fence of, oh, well, this is clearly reverse engineered alien technology. Which side do you land on? I tend to land on the side that we've had it for a long time. A lot of smart people got together and started working on fantastic things. And then it got shoved under the rug and captured and uh, classified. And potential narratives were produced like the UFO narrative to cover up for said technology. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Could be that these, as Grush says, that these uh, crash retrieval programs did indeed result in advanced reverse engineered technology that gave us something like this, self-healing metal. Maybe, maybe. Depends on what side you look at it on. Mm-hmm. Now let's get into a little bit of fuckery, shall we? Let's get into some fuckery. All right. Here we have Gunang or Gunung, Gunung Padang. Uh, there was a groundbreaking study by Indonesian geologist Danny Hillman Nadawijaja and a team that claimed that uh, Ganong Padang in Java, Indonesia, is a multi-layered prehistoric pyramid dating back to 27,000 years B.C. If you recall, Graham Hancock did a whole show called uh, Ancient Apocalypse where he talked about Ganong Padang specifically and about how, I mean, even in the picture, if you're watching this, the picture is pretty stunning of all these, like, rectangular shaped almost like railroad tie esque uh blocks that are all in these strange you know like rectangular patterns and you know seem to be some form of structure so this theory challenges the established timelines and predates even Egypt's oldest pyramid challenging conventional views of the Paleolithic era. Now, researchers used ground, how did, you know, how did they do this? Well, they used ground penetration, radar surveys, radiocarbon dating, and other studies to conclude that Ganung Padang was constructed as a pyramid around 27,000 years ago. The meg megalithic site comprises five terraces, challenges existing estimations that date it to 5,000 BCE at the earliest. If the dating is accurate, Ganung Padang's pyramid disrupts our understanding of the Paleolithic era as it suggests advanced construction during a time when basic huts and crude stone tools were the norm. This would make Ganang Padang older than Gebekli Tepe in Turkey and a well-known Neolithic site. Now, critics, including archaeologist Flint Dibble, question the claims made in the study, particularly the meticulous sculpting in stone layers, suggesting that natural rock movement or weathering could be responsible. Now, if you look at those blocks, look at that image. And tell me if that looks to you like that could be natural uh, weathering. <laughs> you know, could it be natural uh, movement? 
of the rocks that made it look like that? I don't know. He also says that the assertion of sophisticated construction techniques, proposing that the layering might be a result of natural geological processes. Archaeologist Bill Farley highlights the absence of evidence indicating an advanced civilization during the last ice age at Gadung Padang. Soil samples dating back 27,000 years lack human activity traces such as bone fragments. Farley questions the validity of the study by emphasizing the importance of tangible archaeological evidence to support claims. They don't have any evidence to say that it wasn't. That's the problem. They don't have any evidence. That's kind of the issue with the whole UFO thing. You know, it's like we don't have evidence that say, yes, aliens exist, but we also have other things that point to maybe they do. That's why it makes a fun topic. Well, this is kind of in the same way. I mean, you clearly have, based on the look of it, you clearly have this idea that it doesn't look like it was naturally formed. So how did they do it? And so, you know, the it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Graham Hancock, the study's credibility is further questioned due to its association with British writer Graham Hancock. And as the article says, he's known for promoting unsubstantiated pseudoscientific theories about ancient civilizations. And that's part of the issue is that they always claim that he's a pseudoscientist. People claim that he's racist, all this crazy shit, even though he's got a, I think an Indian wife or whatever she is. She's some kind of, she's some kind of, uh, exotic something. She looks like she could carry something on her head with decent effectiveness. So it's just very interesting that there's all this, you know, again, I highlight all the time. I've had Floyd on that highlights all the time. We recently had Michael Cremo that highlighted the fact that there is what, what uh, uh, Michael Cremo says, knowledge filtration. All the It gets all filtered through the mainstream idea of what things were. And if it doesn't fit in, well, then the mainstream says, man, no, no, we're not going to go that route. We're not going to go that route. And I think this next story plays right in, in part with this, which is unbelievable that it's even happening. Well, these days it's really not. Woke, wokeness. In archaeology, oh, go figure, it's fucking everywhere. It's basically became a, a catch-all phrase for, you know, critiques and perceived excesses in contemporary discourse, as the article says. In the ongoing culture war, diverse subjects such as capitalism, COVID, the legal system, James Bond, the police... AI and now archaeology have been labeled as woke. Conservative MP Philip Hollibone criticizes a study from the Museum of London denouncing it as woke archaeology during equalities questions in the House of Commons. Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch expresses concern about the study's methodology and findings. Study published in Bioarchaeology International explores race Population, affinity, and mortality risk during the 14th century bubonic plague in London. Researchers examined the remains of 145 individuals investigating possible ethnic disparities in plague susceptibility. Findings suggest a disproportionate impact on individuals of likely African heritage, possibly linked to existing inequalities and in migration outcomes. <laughs> Good Lord. Minister Babinock incorrectly asserts that the study is based on free phrenology and suggests that linking uh, structural racism to health outcomes may erode trust in the healthcare system, particularly among ethnic minorities. The response challenges the minister's viewpoint by arguing that existing mistrust in the health system among minorities is rooted in documented instances of racial bias. The term woke has evolved from its original meaning of awareness of racial prejudice to a more generalized label for disliked ideas or concepts. Uh, you know, woke people are fucking 
retarded. I mean, let's face it. It's, it. They're fucking retarded. I mean, they're so busy trying to pick on everything that is, what, funny? You know, funny, cultural in any way? I mean, it's it's really fascinating. But uh, the controversy exemplifies the cultural battleground shaping political discourse with a Tory government using culture wars as a defense against electoral challenges. The term woke archaeology is used ironically, suggesting that certain sections of the population dismiss anything labeled woke without serious consideration. The article concludes with a highlighted or a, a lighthearted note questioning the potential absurdity of future battlegrounds in the war on woke, such as woke orienteering, woke carpentry, or woke cutlery. The controversy surrounding woke archaeology reflects broader societal tensions and the evolving nature of language and cultural discourse. The discussion prompts reflection of on how terms like woke are used, misused, and the implications of dismissing certain ideas without nuanced consideration. It's spreading everywhere. It's it's into everything. You know, now you have I going back to the whole Graham Hancock thing is you have this woke culture bleeding into archaeology, calling people like Graham Hancock, who is it who is in an interracial relationship. He's white, and like I said, his wife is some kind of tan, not sure which. But either way, she's darker. And I think she's Indian or Pakistani or I'm not sure, whatever. But either way, either way, they're wrong. And all he's highlighting is the cultural references to these tall, white, long-haired nomad people that seem to have wandered into some of these cultures and taught them agriculture taught them uh you know astronomy taught them sciences i mean a number of things and they want to call them racist and i think the main the real thing is i think the the real idea of this is that i feel like the whole woke agenda is <coughs> targeted it's like a it's it, it's almost like they're they're hired thugs to go after anyone that the government or who who knows who exactly is trying to suppress. And I've said this before that you know while here everybody's saying that you know UFOs and disclosure is being censored and 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 shut down and blocked and all these things it's like Meanwhile, everybody and their brother that has anything to do with UFOs is on podcast tours, their own show. They're all over YouTube. They're on News Nation. They're on Joe Rogan. They're literally everywhere just spouting their shit over and over and over and over again. Stephen Greer's been at this for 33 years. He's never been shut down. He's never been censored. He's been putting out movies forever. Same with Corbell. Same with Knapp. All of these people. TTSA is a thing. Why? Because they're not being censored. Meanwhile, all these other people were being censored all over the place for saying what? That we shouldn't have to give up our freedoms because we're not afraid of being sick. And that and that that the 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 responses to what was going on was was way overboard, was infringing on people's rights over fear. And and that's they're shutting people down for that. And human origins. So what are they really trying to cover up? It seems to me as though it's truth in archaeology, the old shit that's being dug up that 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 
disproves what's being what the the main narrative of archaeology that we've been fed for generations. It challenges all of that, and they don't like it because it's starting to point to the idea that there is a much longer history of humanity on this planet than anyone has ever known, and that it seems to be that that that, that there are groups that know it and that don't want us to know it. Very weird, very weird. So again, I feel like the woke whatever the fuck they are, seem to be these infiltration groups that when the government's like, hey, hey, we need to shut these people up. Oh, they're racist. They're racist. You know, and then all of a sudden it's the woke crews come out and start fucking with everybody. That's what it seems like. That's what it seems like. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but that's what it seems like. So... You know, you tell me, you tell me, what does it look like to you? But to me, it seems like UFO is a hot topic that everybody's allowed to talk about whenever and wherever, but human origins, ancient apocalypse shut down. I mean, it's still there, but it was given a lot of flack. Graham Hancock's been taking a lot of flack forever, you know, so and and based on the words in that article, you know the the um, pseudo scientific and uh, you know and 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 pseudo archaeology, it's those are not accurate terms. Those are not accurate terms. All right, let's get let's get into some uh, some future Skynet type shit. So shall we? Shall we? Look at this. Army robot combat vehicles revealed. Terminator reality coming. A rapid influx of technological advancements as transformed James Cameron's The Terminator from science fiction to a potentially prophetic depiction of future warfare. The U.S. Army's plans to integrate robotic vehicles into its forces mark a significant step reminiscent of the Terminator lore where the first Terminators were ground assault vehicles. The Army is cautiously and methodically developing uncrewed combat vehicles. Cautiously and methodically. Methodically? Yes. Cautiously? Mm, no. Since when? Since when has the government been going at anything cautiously? I doubt that. Uh, UCVs are designed to execute various tasks such as intelligence gathering, surveillance, lethal operations, all guided by crewed vehicles. Intelligence gathering, surveillance, lethal operations. That all sounds fun, doesn't it? The primary motivation behind integrating robots into the Army is to protect the lives of service members, particularly in high-risk situations like ambushes, and to take out the idea of a conscious or a conscience, right? I mean, if you have a robot, the robot will do whatever the fuck you want. Think about the My Lai massacre, Vietnam. If a bunch of AI robots... We're going through me lie. Nobody would have stopped. But instead, you had good people that got wrapped up in a bad thing from the top down. Go and listen to Jocko Winlink, his uh, Jocko's podcast on the me lie massacre. All right. It was from the top down. They were told that it was a only soldier populated village and that anyone that was left there was a sympathizer of the Viet uh, North Vietnamese or South or whoever. I think it was North. Um, but it wasn't true. The intel was bad. Instead, over 500 civilians were massacred because no one stopped. No one except... A couple of soldiers that were that realized what was going on and stepped in and were like, "We're done here. This is this is over," and eventually brought it to an end. But 
that's another benefit. I mean, yes, you're right. You're going to save human lives by not sending them to war. So stop the wars. Don't invent robots, killing robots, so you can further your wars everywhere at, at less human cost. Like, just stop killing each other. Can we do that? Stop doing war. How about that? That'll save lives. But, oh, no, we can't do that. We got to have war. So let's just create robots so we don't have to worry about humans being squeamish when we ask them to kill civilians. Yeah. In 2020, the Army collaborated with Quinetic, North America, and Textron Systems to produce light and medium surrogate uh, RCVs, respectively. Recent decisions favor a single lighter RCV model with four additional companies contracted to produce prototypes for evaluation. Brigadier General Jeffrey Norman and Major General Curtis Buzzard emphasized the transformative capabilities of RCVs, which will be incorporated into groups comprising of crewed vehicle and two Army robot vehicles. RCVs are poised to perform various tasks, including intelligence. I already said that. I mean, it's crazy, man. Army robot prototypes are expected to arrive by August 2024 with a major evaluation scheduled for the spring of 2024 known as Project Convergence. We're going to keep an eye on that. Project Convergence. Interesting. I wonder what they say about Project Convergence. Project Convergence 2022 to demonstrate futuristic joint multinational war fighting technologies. Dude, multinational, I'm telling you, man. One world government with robot soldiers. That's scary shit. Uh, scary shit. Project Convergence focuses on enhancing decision making through a connected combat cloud, integrating data from sensors and shooters in the field. Man, dude. The integration of army robots into military operations signifies a paradigm shift in warfare, echoing science fiction scenarios. Yeah, which are never end well. They never end well. Name one science fiction uh, scenario that ended with humans and robots just like, hey, look at us. Hey, look at us, gang. We're great. No. Most of them not. It's shit like Terminator, man. Oh, boy. The potential to save lives coupled with increased operational efficiency showcases the transformative impact of emerging technologies on modern military strategies. Man, oh, man. Man, oh, man. I'll tell you what. That's some scary fucking shit. Scary fucking shit. And you know what else is scary? China building the world's deepest underground lab to study dark matter located 2,400 meters beneath Jinping Mountain in Sichuan's Liashang Yi Autonomous Prefecture, the deep underground and ultra low radiation background facility or DERF. <laughs> DERF. Oh, wow. Stands as the world's deepest underground lab. Initiated in December 2020, the DERF project is a collaborative effort between Xinhua University and Yalong River Hydro Power Development and Company. The primary objective is to advance research in frontier fields, including practical physics, nuclear astrophysics, and life sciences. Dude, they're studying dark matter. That's crazy. The Deep Underground and Ultra Low Radiation Background Facility for Frontier Physics Experiments, or DERF, not only marks a significant achievement in underground lab construction, but also represents a beacon for groundbreaking, groundbreaking 
scientific research, particularly in the exploration of dark matter and other frontier fields. As it opens its doors to the global scientific community, DERF is poised to play a pivotal role in advancing our understanding of the universe. Is it? Ah, man, I don't know. I mean, who whose hands is it better to be in? Is it better that it's in China's hands or is it better to be in the U.S. hands? I don't know which is worse. I honestly don't. I honestly, honestly don't. I wonder if the whole China's bad is propaganda. I don't know. I've never been there. I only see and hear things that say it is. I honestly don't know. And... I do have evidence that the U.S. government are shysty fucking bastards that will steal technology, turn it into weapons, and annihilate an entire continent with it. Pretty much. Japan, that's what I'm talking about with a nuclear bomb. So I don't know which is better. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know which is better. And speaking of shit that the U.S. has... This is, I still don't know what this is. This X-39B space plane. So it is set for its seventh mission, but it faced setbacks over the weekend, delaying its launch to Monday, carried by a SpaceX Falcon heavy rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Originating as a NASA project in the late 1990s, the X-37, it's been around since the 90s, people. The 90s. The X-37 concept transitioned to the DARPA, of course, developed by the U.S. Air Force as the Orbital Test Vehicle, or OTV. It resulted from collaborative efforts between the Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office, the Air Force Research Lab, and NASA. The X-37B is a reusable spacecraft designed to showcase reuse, excuse me, reusable space technologies. Initially designed for missions lasting up to 270 days, the X-37B has seen its mission durations extend to as much as 908 days. 908 days. Crazy, man. Crazy. But we don't know what it's doing. It's on a mystery. Its upcoming mission is shrouded in mystery with the Space Force's statement emphasizing the importance of experimentation for space, space, or safe space operations. Meaning what? What does that even mean? Despite official statements, the true nature of the X-37B's mission remains undisclosed, adding to its intrigue and global interest. Yeah. Who knows, man? Who knows? But even worse, <laughs> could it get worse? Oh, yes, it can. Here we have the Raytheon Exoatmospheric Kill Vehicle. I'm not even shitting you. That's what it's called. That's not my spin that I put on it. That's what it's actually fucking called. The Exoatmospheric Kill Vehicle defeats ballistic missile in test over Pacific. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Does it really look like that? I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. I don't know. Raytheon, a leading defense technology company, recently achieved a significant milestone with the successful testing of its ETMO, et, et, the EKV, is designed to safeguard the U.S. by intercepting and neutralizing long-range ballistic missiles in low Earth orbit, showcasing advanced capabilities in missile defense in low Earth orbit. Meaning, what I'm gathering out of this is they can take anything out of the sky in low Earth orbit. So if like another country is going to launch and land on the moon, well, maybe they just get hit by the EKV. The kinetic force weapon demonstrated its effectiveness by destroying an intermediate Range ballistic missile during a test conducted in the Pacific region by the U.S. Missile Defense Agency and the U.S. Northern Command. 
Wes Kramer, president of Raytheon, emphasized that this successful test validates the operational, reliable, and ready nature of the U.S. ballistic missile defense system. Yeah, man. Highlighting Raytheon's expertise, Kramer noted the Raytheon kill vehicles have completed nearly 50 space intercepts, showcasing the company's ability to design and develop systems to counter evolving threats. Well, when, like what space intercepts? What does that even mean? What does that even mean? What could it really be? <sighs> Dude. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's so scary to think that, that this is what they're doing. I, I, I just don't know what to think about it. I don't know what to think about it. I just, it's, it's scary, y'all. It's scary. It's scary. And I don't know what to think about it. All I know is like the fact that it's called the exo atmospheric kill vehicle and the U.S. government's got a hold of it, I'm not warm and fuzzy. I believe I see militia forming. Tinfoil. It's militia. Stop, militia! The tinfoil. Militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. I want to thank y'all so much. I mean, I love the support. It's amazing. I appreciate it. I love y'all. We it's uh, we've got a new member of the Tinfoil Militia, by the way. Julian Lloyd has signed up with a whole whopping dollar donation. No note, but hey, doesn't matter. Dollar, ten dollars, hundred dollars. I love it all. Bring it on. I love you. Thank you. It means the world to me. I really do appreciate it. Very, 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 very much. It really, I really do. It's it's. It's fantastic to think that we're building a little community here of tinfoilists as the tinfoil militia. So, Julian, welcome to the tinfoil militia. And now you've officially got your first start to Admiral with that $1. So, you know, all it takes is a thousand more and you're there. But that's the whole deal. It's, it's about an investment into the show, the road. You can build it however you want. We've got a running in there. Right at the top is Casey Armadillo with a whopping 240 bucks. But we got a whole bunch of people involved, and we love it. The Tinfoil Militia, thank you so much. You're all amazing. I love you. You can find everything about UFO No Podcast and the Tinfoil Militia at ufonopodcast.net, where we do the value-for-value value model. We're talking about time, talent, and treasure. We don't want sponsors. We don't like that shit, the spoozy, whatever the fuck that all is. Ugh. It's gross. I don't want anything to do with it. I would much rather have a supportive community where we can talk about shit. And speaking of which, we got a Discord so you can continue the conversation there. I got a place where you can put your encounters. I got a place where you can put uh, AI artwork if you would like. Or you can just generally trat, chat, trat, chat in the clubhouse uh, during, after, before every show. Doesn't matter. Always accessible. Join the Discord. Um, otherwise, we've got... New episodes coming every Sunday. This Sunday, we're going to be talking about the Peru alien attack. And I think we're going to go in some directions y'all might not be uh, prepared for. It's going to be a good one. Very excited. And then uh, as well as our New Year's Eve show coming up. Big one. It's going to be a big one. And for Christmas, because uh, Sunday is on Christmas and uh, I've got a family. You know, I'm sure as well as a lot of you do. So we're going to be doing a... I'm going to be showcasing the very first episode of uh, the UFO No podcast with Blind Mike and my friend Lucas Dixon way back, way back when we started this thing. It's going to be fun. So tune in. We got a lot in store. Love you all. Find us Sunday, 6.30 p.m. live every Sunday. Otherwise, love you all. Get involved. Buy merch. Be an official tinfoilist in the tinfoil militia. And remember, stay elevated. Keep your eyes on the skies and watch out for the government. They're shysty bastards. Peace out, y'all. Bye-bye-bye-bye-bye.